uh, present. Thank you, Lord, for uh, allowing us to be open. If you like what you hear tonight uh, and you're on our uh, uh, website, go to myamc.org. Uh, There's a uh, donate button on the page. Can't miss it. I think it's right in the middle now. Uh, our videos will come up. Beautiful ordered list. Uh, I'm going to use two Bibles tonight because there's uh, a lot to cover and it's a little detailed. So, so tonight's message title is, How Did This Happen? Or in the Hebrew, Yecha. Alas. Why or how? How is how it's translated in the King James and is the title for the book of Lamentations. How do we get into this mess that we're in? And it's the central book in a collection of ancient scrolls called the Five Scrolls or the five megalot, and are part of the Kedavim, or the writings in the Tanakh. And so these five scrolls, uh, I'll list them off for you. They're, they're the Canticles, right? Most of you know them as the Song of, knows that book as the Song of Solomon, uh, the Book of Ruth, Book of Lamentations. Talk about that tonight. Ecclesiastes and Esther. Uh, they make, as a group, uh, a good group of books to study as a group, kind of like, like as a mini-study. Mini and within that, I would say, if you're looking at Lamentations, add into that Baruch and Jeremiah, sort of like as a sub-study, if you're studying that one book. Um, so... so And so, Lamentations, uh, boy, it's a book about Israel. It's a book about Israel and uh, the nation itself and its woes. How did it get itself into the woes? It's usually read uh, at the fast during the 9th of Av, usually, usually in August. Fascinating, fascinating book. Uh, in terms of structure, and I want to read to you t tonight from the com uh, Companion Bible uh, some excerpts. Uh, I'm going to talk from chapter 1 tonight, uh, but the book itself uh, is structured this way. It consists of five elegies. So what, what is an elegy? An elegy is a poem of mourning so there's five of these elegies uh, in this book. First one is uh, about the return of the 12 spies and the decree of the 40-year wandering and the consequences of the rebellion of the people. The second one is the destruction of the first temple by Nebuchadnezzar. The third one is the destruction of the second temple by the Romans under Titus. The taking of Bethar by the Romans under Hadrian. 580,000 perished, a lot of people. And the fifth one is the plowing of Zion like a field in fulfillment of Jeremiah 20, uh, verse 18. And so the book is structured in a very, very unique way. Uh, the first two chapters, chapters one and two, they consist of 22 long, 22 long verses, and they're grouped in triplets, three lines apiece, each verse respectively commencing with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The third chapter consists of 26 verses, three sections of 22 verses, each triad of verses com commencing with the same letter, like the first three lines, you know, commence with like Aleph, the next three with Beth, and so on, through the 22 letters 
uh, of the Hebrew alphabet. Fourth chapter is arranged in 22 long verses a little differently, of two lines each. Also arranged acrostically. An acrostic is sort of, there's a hidden meaning there. And the fifth chapter, uh, it's really a prayer and the acrostic, the arrangement uh, gives way before the end of the prayer and there's just this, because it's a poem, there's just this outburst of emotion. But in that chapter, the only connection with the alphabet is that the number of verses corresponds with the number of letters, 22. So the book, book is structured in a very, uh, very unique way. Um, I was moved by that just by the fact that there was such deep meaning with the Hebrew alphabet covering, uh, covering the woes of Israel. So it really spoke to me. I can't think uh, of a more appropriate book for us to be in at least this year when we are contemplating our own woes. This is a timely book for our country right now. So if you're looking for something to study that's appropriate, you need to be in this book. And make no mistake about it we are a nation that's in a season of judgment we must remind ourselves of this that God is outside uh, of time and what he does is he works in seasons okay seasons so I want to go to the book of Ecclesiastes and just uh, explain to you what I mean by that. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 says this, To every thing there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. We go back and look this up in the Hebrew. It's very, a very interesting uh, verse by itself, uh, it, it better reads like this. To every and thing there is, I have some notes here, I th- believe that that was added, is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven. But in the Hebrew, it reads better like this. To the all stated time and season for of every event, under the heavens. And that Hebrew word there for season is, uh, it's pronounced uath. It's Strong's H6256. And what it means is time, especially continuously. Continuous time. That was very interesting. And while we're talking about Ecclesiastes, it's, that's part of that group of five books also. So it's a book, really. I like to think of it as, as Solomon theorizing and writing down the futility and vanity of life. And then at the end of the book, he concludes with the futility and vanity of life lived without God. Summation. Sometimes I wonder if that book, in fact, was his own autobiography. Something to think about. That word season, I'm going to come back to that. It's it's a collection of days, months, and years ordered sequentially, perhaps with gaps of time in between them where we maybe switch to another season for another ordering of time. And then maybe we come back to that season. 
Uh, but that first verse does suggest this, that the times associated with these seasons are sequential and, and they're continuous in that they have defined beginning and end usually marked by an event. So I'd like to read with you before we get into Lamentations because they're very closely tied uh, to the message tonight. Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 through 8. I read verse 1, we read 2 through 8. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Now, I don't proclaim to know exactly where in those seven verses we are as a nation, but suffice to say this, we are not at a time to laugh. Nobody's laughing lately about the season we're in. I don't see a lot of joy on a lot of faces right now. So take some time to read Ecclesiastes 3, 2 through 8 and let the Lord speak to you maybe individually about where we are and where are you what season are you in? We may never see the day. Pay attention. We may never see the day again where there is truly a fair and free election in this country. You realize that. You realize that that is a possibility right now. We may never see a day again where we are free to give our opinion without being censored or rebuked or some type of consequence or retribution for what we say or espouse to be part of. Some context. Um, many, many warnings have been given to this country, especially to the public facing church the evangelical church call it has, has chosen uh, the way of compromise they've chosen the way of apathy false teaching some Yeshua some Jesus that's going to just come down and take us to heaven so we can be saved from our own sin because we're just too weak to deal with our own sin and really don't want to face our own sin. We don't want to give up our gods of, well, you know, you can, you can just name whatever our gods are, really, as a nation. So it's best to cover that up and say from the pulpit this, God is going to save us from that. Oh yeah, he's, he, he's going to save us from that. I.e., God's going to save us from ourselves, right? Uh, in our depraved state, which has, after all, it's resulted really from this. It's been 150 years or more, really, of disobedience, false gospel that's been allowed 
to permeate. But we hear from the pulpit this. God's going to rapture us to be with him. Yes, God is going to rapture. He's going to rapture us in our apathetic, apostate state because after all, God loves us. That's how far we have gone as a church. Make no mistake about it. That is, that is many, if you go to these churches, that is many of the messages that are coming out of these pulpits. So I want you to picture this. Imagine millions of these so-called believers, right, meeting the Lord in the air in their apostate condition. And what, what do we see? The, the picture is this, is that they appear to the Lord like they've been dragged out of the mud, spiritually speaking, been dragged out of the mud. They're just dark and covered with mud. Oh, oh they, they got their Bible. They got their Bible with them as they meet the Lord in the air. Um, it's barely readable because they haven't been reading it. Um, and they come before the Lord above the earth in this great meeting of souls. And they say to the Lord, we have prophesied in your name. And the Lord says, thank you. Thank you very much. Would you please step into the elevator to the right, please? And all these millions of people step into this giant elevator. And the door is shut. And Yeshua presses the down button and says, depart from me. I never, never knew you. That sounds like something out of your own imagination. I don't think so. If that were to happen today. Meanwhile, back at the gathering, there's a relatively small group of people there. Right? Ah, yes, but they have on their wedding garments. And the Lord has waiting for them. He's got, a, he's got a chariot waiting for them. And they have these and these chariots have beautiful horses, all reined in their regalia. And for that group of people. He's decorated them and he's ready to escort his bride home. Are we striving today, really, to be part of that caravan? Are we reaching out to people, family members, meeting them where they are? Maybe preparing to hear from the Lord. I know there's many, many people uh, who are hearing this message tonight who are in this situation. I know I'm one of them where the Lord is preparing me what to say. Perhaps when I get that call and one of my family members is on a respirator, what are we going to say to them? And I want to say this, there are, there are parallels in the Bible that we are to look at as examples of warnings of what not to do. Um, what, if, what if the prophet Jeremiah had access to even a small amount uh, of the information that we had today? Would his message have been even more urgent? It's pretty urgent then. Um, so again, I say that Lamentations should be read with Jeremiah, um, 
Jeremiah's book. <laughs> I, I think of Jeremiah as being um, a book about a lot of things. So what came to my mind today, backsliding, right? backsliding, nation that backslides. Uh, false teachings was another thing. False interpretations based on what we see our way of seeing it. Right? There's a lot of that in that book. We see groups today in our country and all over the world, but particularly in our country, who are claiming to be Christians who are defending Christianity based on their own personal assessment of what they think think the Constitution means. Have you heard that? A lot of groups quoting the Constitution, right? I'll tell you this. The Constitution requires a fair amount of study. It, it isn't just something you, you just pick up and you read. It requires a fair amount of study. Um, You'd be surprised at what you've, you, you would gain if you took the necessary time to really study the Constitution. But we have a lot of false teachings. And, and, and the boldness that is now coming out of those groups who claim to be Christians, but at their core, really, just hear me out on this, they're really advocating this, a violent overthrow of this country so that either individually or collectively they can administer their own agenda. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, we're going to do this. And in the name of the Christian values that have formed this nation, based on what their leader claims to know, or has heard from God about. Be careful of that. Oh my goodness, be careful of that. Advocacy and the freedom of speech is one thing. And that's, that's clearly defined in the Constitution. Uh, if, you, if you study the parameters of that, right? You study the parameters of that. But violence and vengeance, we must remember, is administered by the Lord. You know, since this is Super Bowl, Super Bowl weekend, I thought I'd bring this into it. You know, the Lord, he, he's the playmaker, right? He's, he's the playmaker. He's the quarterback, right? He's, he's our, he should be our field general. Uh, let me ask you this. If, if you were a football player and you're on the field and, and Yeshua stepped out and he got maybe everybody here, all of us. I think this would go well with us. But if you got a group of people in a huddle, and in, you know, when you're in that huddle, if you played football, right, the quarterback is in the middle, and everybody's looking at the quarterback for the call, right? What's, what's the call? What, what's the play? And we, we've got Yeshua there, and we're looking at him. And he says, pray unceasingly. Break. Maybe take a time out. Before we got on that scrimmage line and waited for that snap count. You know what? I, 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 just, I just don't think so. I don't think we would like that. We would like that particular call. I don't think we have the discipline right now. Um, you know why? We just want to smash somebody's mouth. We just want to want to take somebody out. Lord, pray unceasingly. Smashing somebody's mouth in the name of Jesus. We need to be careful of that. You know, everybody's been commenting about <laughs> this this great reset that's about to happen. Well, you know what? God has his own reset. 
in store for his church. Believe me, he's got a, he's got a reset that will counter any other reset that these other people have this year, and that will dwarf in scope anything that's going on. Um, if my people who are called by name, my name would humble themselves and stop creating new ways to interpret what God's doing. I'll just throw that in there. <laughs> Interpreting what God's doing. If we would only just stop doing that and getting in God's way. And, and I, I say that because I wanted to give the context tonight before I get into this book. That is where we are tonight. Friday, February 5th, 2021. That's, that's where we start this out. And so I'm going to re- be reading from Lamentations 1 through 1. Uh, through uh, 1 through 22, these 22 verses. Uh, We're going to follow up in the weeks ahead with uh, the other four chapters. Um, But in this first chapter, really, what is it? It's an A to Z grief message. (laughs) You want to put it that way? We have 22 letters in the alphabet, but uh, it's what I would call dirge poetry, if you like. That's what it is. It's, 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 it's an example of dirge poetry. Not uncommon at that time. It's timelines around 586 B.C. And these 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are used in succession uh, to begin the lines and sections of these songs. Why use the alphabet? I'll tell you why. To symbolize the completeness of the, gr- of the grief that the Lord is expressing through this prophet. It's as if the Lord were grieving himself. So in verses 1 through 12, what we have is Jerusalem is afflicted. The city has afflicted itself with, with no comfort. And in particular, verses 1 through 2, we, what we see here, if you're following me, uh, in uh, Lamentations 1, verses 1 through 2, it's, it, he's grieving over an empty city. The city's empty now. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow sh- is she who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become now a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. How lonely sits the city. He's writing after the catastrophe of Jerusalem's defeat. Once it was a city full of people, now she's empty. When she was great among the nations, and now she's a slave. She was great among the nations. You know what? So was Athens. Once the glory of grief, uh, Greece, rather, and now it's just nothing like what it was before. She weeps bitterly in the night. And Jeremiah thought of Jerusalem as the widow princess brought low weeping uncontrollably with none to comfort her. The prophet, prophet's sorrow is deep, it's plain. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. In better days, Jerusalem did enjoy loyal alliances. And those one-time friends that she used to have have now become her enemies. Israel was always faced with an inescapable choice. She could rely on God for her safety against external aggression, or she could turn to allies, great and small. Hmm. Verses 3 through 6, we see the city under the affliction from the Lord now. Judah has gone into captivity, under affliction and hard servitude, 
She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her in dire straits. The road to Zion, the roads to Zion mourn because no one comes to set to the set feasts or to the set appointments. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted and she is in bitterness. Her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper. For the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. And from the daughter of Zion, all her splendor has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture, that flee without strength before the pursuer. No one comes to the set feasts, the routes to Jerusalem once thronged with pilgrims going up to the temple to participate. And now they're deserted. For the Lord has afflicted her. And you know the prophet understood this. He, he, he understood this. That the catastrophe. It wasn't due to fate. Human cruelty. Or the blind cycles of history. It was because. Judah had sinned. So long. And so deep. That it was God's will. To afflict her with severe correction. Oh. Is that where we are. Is that where we're headed? Are we as a nation right at that beginning part where when we cross the Red Sea and, you know, we started complaining the bad report and the Lord sentenced those people to wander for 40 years? Are we, as we begin this year, in the beginnings of a 40-year wandering in the wilderness. Is that where we are as a nation? The multitude, the multitude of her transgressions. list goes on and on. We have killed millions of unborn babies. The multitude of her transgressions. All her splendor has departed. Jeremiah's pain was amplified as he thought of how it used to be. You know, it's, it's, I said this, I think I said this to my wife. I said, it's one thing when you come out of a country that w- was was under communism or socialism. You flee a country. You come here to be free. You taste that freedom. You like it. You, you know, even if you don't know God, you have to uh, be th- thanking maybe from the innermost parts of your spirit and don't know it, thanking for delivering you out of that other country. And then you see a country that's going back to what you came out of. That has got to be terrible. There are, I'm thinking of all of those immigrants who have come to this country to be free, who are looking at what's happening and are saying, I thought I came here to get away from this, and now it's happening all over again. It's, it's, it's got to be heartbreaking. Her princes have become like deer. Both hope and leadership for the city abandoned Jerusalem. The princes, the people who were in, in power, they ran away like deer. In verse 7, Jeremiah is talking about he he can't help remembering the pleasant days. In the days of her affliction and roaming, Jerusalem remembers all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old when her people fell into the hands of the enemy, 
with no one to help her, the adversary saw her and mocked of her downfall. Uh, the tragedy of Jerusalem fall was worse after considering how things were once so much better. Yeah, I, I, I think I just said that. It's, it, it's, it's different to taste freedom and to lose it. I always say it's maybe it's even worse than never having tasted it. Verses 8 through 11, the reason Jerusalem is left, gives the reason that Jerusalem is left without comfort. Jerusalem has sinned gravely. Therefore, she has become vile. All who honor her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sighs and turns away. Her uncleanness is on her skirts. She did not consider her destiny. Therefore, her collapse was awesome. She had no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy is exalted. The adversary has spread his hand over her pleasant things, for she has seen the nations under her sanctuary, those whom you commanded not to enter your assembly. All her people sigh. They seek bread. They have given their valuables for food to restore life. See, O oh Lord, and consider, for I am scorned. They have seen her nakedness. It was a once dignified city. It was humiliated and exposed. Like a queen stripped of her royal robes, she sighs and turns away. She did not consider her destiny. Like a foolish woman or a man, Jerusalem never thought about where her path of sin and rebellion would lead her. Her lack of forethought meant her collapse was awesome. Are we on the verge of that in this country right now? in many of our cities. Verse 12, incomparable sorrow. Is it nothing to you, all you pass by? Behold and see, is there, if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted in the day of his fierce anger, is it anything all you who pass by? We see very much an unsympathetic world looking upon the United States, but this is what happened. An unsympathetic world looked on Jerusalem's misery, misery and regarded as nothing. She had no comforter. There's no comforter for her. Jerusalem felt what many sufferers feel, that her sorrow was incomparable to others, and incomprehensible to others. A desolation and distress brought upon the city and its inhabitants had scarcely any parallel ever seen before. There was nothing like it. There's nothing like it. God's hand in Jerusalem's tragedy in verses 13 through 15, what the Lord did to Jerusalem. From above he has sent fire into my bones and it overpowered them. He has spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He has made me desolate and faint all the day. The yoke of my transgressions was bound. They were woven together by his hands and thrust upon my neck. He made my strength fail. The Lord delivered me into the hands of those whom I am not able to withstand. The Lord has trampled underfoot all my mighty men in my midst. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord trampled as a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. The fire of the judgment of the Lord came to Jerusalem. Verses 16 and 17. Now the prophet is weeping. He's weeping without comfort. For these things I weep, my eye, my eye overflows with water because the comforter who should restore my life is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Zion spreads out her hands, but no one comforts her. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that those around him become his adversaries. Jerusalem has become an, become an unclean thing among them. Verses 18 and 19. Uh, 
prophet. He confesses God's righteousness in Jerusalem's sin. Here's what he says as he comes out of this state of weeping. The Lord is righteous, for I rebelled against his commandment. Hear now all peoples, and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. I call for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders breathed their last in the city while they sought food to restore their life. In verses 20 through 22, finally, out of this distress, the prophet calls for justice. See, O Lord, see, O Lord, that I, I am in distress. My soul is troubled. My heart is overturned within me. For I have been very rebellious. Outside the sword bereaves. At home it is like death. They have heard that I sigh, but no one comforts me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. Bring on the day you have announced that they may become like me. Let all their wickedness come before you and do to them as you have done to me. For all my transgressions for my sighs are many and my heart is faint. See, O oh Lord, that I am in distress. All Jerusalem can do is cry out to God, whom, whom, whom she rejected. She rejected and now she's crying out to the Lord. Do to them as you have done to me. We may lawfully pray for such evils to the enemies of the church and people of God as may restrain and weaken their hands and put them out of capacity of wasting the Lord's heritage. We are only obliged by it to wish well to their souls and to desire no evil against them out of private revenge or malice, but only out of love to God, the zeal for his glory. And these last two verses are a tentative prayer that God will vindicate his righteousness among the other nations. For my sighs are many and my heart is faint. We see Jerusalem, um, it's almost gone. It almost just was wiped out from the face of the earth. And all she can manage is a series of sighs and faint heart. And so what what do we learn from this? We should be warned from this dirge that a similar fate, a similar fate awaits any nation. This is why we have this as an, ex as an, ex an, an example. A similar fate awaits any nation who dares to call itself Christian and then abandons God. If God did not spare the natural branches, his people, how much more will the Lord rain down judgment upon those who are unfaithful to Yeshua, who is the Lord of the covenant? We see right now, right, right as we are speaking, a great falling away right now. Judgment Mourning awaits all nations who forsake God. As the Lord bent, the Lord bent over backwards. We forget this. Bent over backwards to send prophet after prophet after prophet to warn Israel and Judah. The Lord raises up ministers who are called to warn the people to repent. But like the false prophets in Jeremiah's day, they would rather listen to the false prophets who promise prosperity and peace. That's what we have going on in the church today. We have a lot of people still pro promising prosperity and peace. I ask you to look around. We see everything on the verge of falling in. Nations are disintegrating, including our own. And what are they disintegrating from? It's, it's, it's not from a famine. You know, most nations back in that time, you know, they, 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 they got in trouble, went through hard times, even went away because of, of food. 
But what do we see here? Not of bread, of water, but for hearing the word of the Lord. That's the famine that's in this, in this country right now. There's, there's a famine for truth. Judgment has been perverted. There is one law for the elite and another for the common person. The poor cry out, but nobody cares. Nobody cares about the poor. They're expendable, as the Rusty said. That's two messages. In some places, they are severely persecuted. As Christian nations stray more and more from the truth, the people are being made captives and exiles in their own country. We literally, we're, we are uh, becoming captives and in exile in our own country. We don't have to be removed to Babylon, right? Babylon comes to us here to oppress us. It's a great example of this. We forget about this. Rome came to Israel and made the Jews captive in their own land, right? Didn't take them away. Made them captives in their own land. Is that what's happening to us? Do we have a group of people out there that are going to make us captives in our own country? What, what's, ha- what's happened? Well, I will say this. There's a silver lining to this um, as we get into the, uh, the other teachings. Uh, the middle of the book of Lamentation tells us of God's eternal faithfulness, and that's really what Lamentations 3 is about. Even in the midst of catastrophic judgment, the Lord does show mercy and compassion. Uh, Jeremiah did not completely escape the suffering of Judah. We read the book, we see he was really put through the ringer. Even though he was allowed to stay in the land, he was seized by the people and taken with them into Egyptian exile. But unlike countless others who perished in the siege of Jerusalem, he lived to tell about it with these five highly structured poems that are in this book. Um, it's a thoughtful and reflective grief and not just the cry of utter despair. It, does us, it, it would do us well this year to reflect upon our sufferings and not just throw our hands up in the air. Oh. One little note here. Um, in Lamentations 1, verse 12, uh, Charles Jennings selected this tes- text for Handel to use in his famous Messiah. The reason we have hope even in despairing times is that Yeshua, like Jeremiah, was a, he was a weeping prophet. He wept bitterly. Right? Yeshua wept bitterly as he came into the city of Jerusalem. Look that up. Luke 19, 41 and 45. Forget about that. Yeshua wept when he came into Jerusalem. When everyone saw an earthly Messiah coming into the city to overthrow the Romans, Yeshua had other ideas. He did not need deliverance from the Romans. They needed deliverance from sin. He came to suffer the desolation caused by our disobedience upon his cross. Was there any sorrow like unto sorrow in that day? None. We realize that God will even work out our sorrows for our eternal good. People who reject Yeshua, what happens to them? They go from sorrow to even greater sorrow. They cry out in pain and despair. So many in this world today feel totally alone. Um, And we are reminded tonight in this message that we are presented with a wonderful opportunity, even though we suffer along with them, we get to tell the story of Yeshua who is acquainted with our grief, who carried our sorrows. It's our calling here. He was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and will return to receive us unto him to sorrow no more. It's the message we need to get to these many, many people out there, they don't see it that way. Like, like I said, they, they go from sorrow to even greater sorrow. That's what we're seeing. And so finally, um, we here at 
this congregation, we continue to preach the truth and call upon everyone to reflect, consider, uh, and even repent. Being a Christian means that we are not here, we're not here to cause suffering to others. If necessary, we will suffer in our suffering. Follow the examples of Yeshua, our Lord. Um, and so before I do the offering tonight, I would encourage all of you online and here tonight to spend maybe the next 10 minutes or so in worship with the Lord, reflecting on the truth of where we really are and what can I do about it tonight. We come back uh, with a short closing message. Be we blessed by that. Uh, take some time with the Lord. Amen. Uh, I do want to say this. For all of you here tonight, and particularly for our online viewers, um, please take into account tonight the entire uh, counsel of God in all of our messages. Uh, not just this one tonight. Uh, but any, not, and not any one of them, but all of them. Some of you may be saying, well, I, I have a favorite. I, I like this person or that person. Um, but God has you here and wants you to take in the entire counsel of God. And you're going to need that in these end days. In particular, uh, these last 30 days, Look at the messages. There's uh, a lot of wisdom, uh, and, and a, a good, a good speaking to, to us as a nation from the Lord. So I encourage all of you to go back, go back, watch and rewatch as many of these sermons and teachings uh, that you can each week. I would, I would start my week off with the adult ed mes message. If you can, join us for the power hour of prayer. And then join us on Shabbat. Um, hey, you know, we're, we're back open again. Back open again. We're taking as many precautions as possible. And then take the Shabbat as the end of the week, the rest period, and, and meditate on all that you've learned for the week. Take that afternoon and meditate on that. Uh, contemplate it. Drink it. Discuss it. Maybe meet as a family uh, and discuss what the Lord has done to you and through you for the past week so that you're ready for the next week. That's really what a church is about. We're here to fill you up uh, so that you can go about living life, um, you know, that, that's our goal. It's to, it's to grow you in the ability to deal with life in many ways in this broken, messed up, end times world because that is what it is. And finally, I want to say this is now that we're going to be open again, people, people have been coming for a while and you online, uh, be looking for, for, for now on to be be looking at each relationship. Each relationship that you build and cultivate inside of these walls, I want you to think about them as, as eternal. They, they're, e they're eternal relationships. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't some you know, temporary, well, <laughs> you know, well this, is, this is where God placed me and uh, I may not be in this church in a year or five years. Attitude. Regardless, the relationships that you sow here are eternal relationships. They go on with you. And are you seeing them that way? Um, perhaps consider that God sees your participation here very differently, very differently than you do, and, is, and maybe has been trying or is continuing to try to get you out of your comfort zone. For online viewers, are going to be back here. Our doors are open. Like I've said before, God wants you out of your comfort zone. Uh, you've heard me mention this many times before. 
sometimes we create this discomfort zone. I'm going to use the term the mind prison. We create this mind prison for ourselves. And don't think that he's releasing you tonight uh, from your cell to come here only to return back to your cell and visit us again next Shabbat when he releases you again without you making some changes. Maybe there's small changes. Little changes that you make to sow these return, eternal relationships. Maybe there's you know, another spot for you on that Shamash list hanging on the fellowship hall. Out there for you, maybe some of you online viewers. Um, you know, if you can't help, I can't help this. Uh, you remember, do you remember that song from the, from the 60s? See if I can, please release me, let me go. Maybe there's an extra hour a week outside the walls or, f- or outside of your daily routine of your week. Maybe it might be just putting stickers on some jewelry. Or fixing the faucet in the bathroom where we can get a nice consistent flow of hot water during this COVID crisis. Is there somebody out there that can help us with that or we'd sure, we'd sure love that. Or just asking, how, how, how can we help? Something, something in service to the Lord that, um, I'll just say this very carefully, maybe it accelerates your release date. Amen? All right, I'm going to invite Pastor Cheryl up and she's going to do the uh, ironic benediction with me. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you the peace, the peace of the Shar Shalom. Thank you for joining us, especially you online viewers, and uh, be blessed and safe travels. Amen.